Now, there's no question, at least from man's point of view, that some life forms are more important than others. We could perhaps survive without certain flowers or trees or wildlife. We may, in fact, someday have to. But I'm optimistic that drastic decisions will never have to be made. I hope at the time this film ends, you'll be optimistic too. Because this is a story about a group of people who have been concerned about living resources of this planet for over 35 years. More importantly, they've been doing something about it. It was 1936, seven years after the Wall Street crash that would send the world into the midst of a Great Depression. It was also seven years after the beginning of a devastating drought, yet to relinquish its grip on the breeding grounds of ducks all across the Prairie Pothole region. The ducks were suffering their own depression, and many hunters believed that they were about to see the end of waterfowling. Duck hunters all over the United States were putting their fowling pieces in mothballs. Many refused to buy even a federal duck stamp or a license, let alone a box of shells. It just isn't worthwhile to go duck hunting these days, having to get up early in the morning or sit out in hard weather for a shot or two all day. I wouldn't want my son to pursue a sport that I love so well that has sunk to such a low level after the way I have known it. The season that year was a mere 30 days, and many hunters fully expected the 1937 season to be closed completely. It was the dual disasters of drought and drainage that had wrought the Duck Depression. And it was the dual disasters of drought and drainage that gave birth to Ducks Unlimited, an idea whose time had come, and an organization whose principles and passion are still as evident today as they were in the beginning. This is their story. Even before the worst of the drought, we knew we were in a duck depression. I visited my favorite fowling waters and I found nothing but empty skies. All that was left of the great flights were my memories. I knew then that we had to do something and do it soon. The banks of a trout stream may seem like a strange place for the birth of an organization devoted to waterfowl, but that is where Ducks Unlimited was born. At the lodge were John C. Huntington, son of a St. Louis attorney, who as early as 1912 had begun promoting restoration of game birds. Arthur M. Bartley, a man who liked to get his hands dirty and his feet wet. Ray E. Benson, an experienced shotgunner who would later edit the first Ducks Unlimited magazine. And at the head of the table was Joseph Palmer Knapp, they had already formed and funded an organization which had laid out a 10-year plan of action for increasing the number of upland game birds. But now they were about to do something incredibly bold, something that had never been done before, create an organization that would manage habitat on a massive scale to impact species that span an entire continent. What started at that club with those men on that day would remain the key elements that define DU to this day. Volunteerism, partnerships, science-based decision-making, and a sound business model. It is not what man does, but what he does not do for migratory waterfowl, which is chiefly responsible for diminishing numbers. What is urgently needed is a program which will take no account of international boundaries, but will bring neighbor nations of the North American continent into harmonious accord for the good of the game. Most hunters spend countless hours and dollars on ways to bring more ducks to their blind, but we were talking about a need to manage waterfowl over the entire continent. And it had become clear that Mother Nature needed a helping hand.
Faced with the prospect of shortened or closed duck seasons, Knapp and the others had decided that immediate action was required. But first, they would have to gain a fuller understanding of the causes of the duck decline. To do so, they undertook what has been called the granddaddy of all wildlife surveys, the 1935 International Wild Duck Census. The survey area was to cover over 750,000 square miles in Canada and an additional 230,000 square miles in the United States in an area that is sparsely settled and poorly eroded. When the survey was completed, more game birds issued their findings. They reported that in the area surveyed, they believed there were 42.7 million ducks with an estimated 65 million birds for the entire continent. This survey became the template for how seasons and bag limits are established even today. But most important, the census also dramatically reinforced what the founders of DU had suspected all along. The focus of North American waterfowlers must begin in the prairies of Canada.